Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Transportation Finance and Policy Committee for this Groundhog Day, Thursday, February 2nd. And uh, our first item of business is the uh, approval of the minutes. Represent Petersburg. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I approve the minutes of, it, of January 31st. Uh, thank you, Representative Petersburg. Is there a discussion? Uh, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed, the motion prevails. Uh, members, we have a, a special hearing today. Um, no, no bills, but um, uh, we did this in uh, 2021. Uh, I thought it was very uh, impactful, and um, uh, we'll, uh, we'll do it again uh, this year in person, which I'm very excited about. Uh, we have uh, uh, an entire hearing devoted to transit equity. Um, this is really uh, to co uh, correspond with the, the birthday, upcoming birthday of Rosa Parks. And uh, I think, you know, her example was uh, sort of the intersection of um, mobility and justice and civil rights. And so, um, so we have a number of uh, presentations and testimony today. Um, I'll just ask, we will take breaks inter uh, intermittently for uh, member questions uh, and a number of people who will be making presentations. I want to remind uh, those uh, who will be testifying to uh, stay within the uh, time limits that uh, were prescribed to you. And with that, uh, we'll start with um, MJ Carpio. Welcome to the committee, and please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Sure. Good morning, Chair Hornstein and members of the Transportation Committee. My name is MJ Carpio. I'm with Move Minnesota. We are an organization advocating for expanded public transit, and we're also part of a coalition that's advocating for improved walking, biking, and rolling infrastructure. Uh, thank you for hosting Transit Equity Day. It's a celebration of Rosa Parks' birthday and the accomplishment of promoting transit as a civil right. Um, but we still have a long, long way to go. Uh, equity in a societal and even legal sense means fairness. And if we're asking people to be full, mobile, contributing participants in our societies, then we also need to provide the fair means to do so. And in a transit context, that means access to bus lines close to people's homes, frequent and reliable service, decriminalizing people who rely on transit for warmth and granting, giving transit operators and the staff the incentives and the tools to meet safety and accessibility needs for any and all passengers. And holistically speaking, equity also means clean air, clean water, and a climate that won't perpetuate existing inequalities. And transportation remains to be the number one source of pollution in the state of Minnesota. Um, and no, it's not from public transit, it's from cars. SUVs, trucks, and minivans. And this is a problem that we may not experience equally, but it is a problem that we have to solve collectively. And this is not to say that cars have to have no place in society with a snap of a finger. I'm super grateful for all the carpool rides that I've gotten to take to go to the Boundary Waters or Lake Superior, uh, even the Iron Range. And you know, as a lifelong public transit user, I felt forced to own a car about two years ago to supplement my transit use, and I acknowledge that. Yet it's different from car dependence. A society that's willfully designed to be car dependent is neither equitable nor is it sustainable. And so with that, today you'll hear from other transit riders and advocates about their experiences, and from local and national experts about increasing access to transit and reducing dependence on cars. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify. I look forward with I look forward to working with members of this committee to uh, fund the necessary, uh, get the necessary funding and policies for world-class transit here in Minnesota. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, our next uh, testifier is Dan Collison. Is Dan here? I just arrived. Uh oh, okay. Uh, if you want to, yeah. Like yeah. speak from? E, uh, the podium straight ahead. <coughs> you need to catch your breath for a few seconds. Yeah, That's a second. I apologize. <laughs> right here? Yeah. Good morning. Welcome sure. to the committee just in time. Yes. And uh, please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Chair. And I identify any organizational affiliation that you have. Yes. 
So my name is Dan Collison. I'm Director of Business Development and Public Affairs for Sherman Associates. We're a real estate uh, development company based in Minneapolis, but develop across the state. And I travel across the state, including Duluth and Rochester, to build housing with about 70% of that being affordable. I'm here to speak on behalf of this important matter because I've been a public transit user and advocate for many years. The last 10 years of my life prior to working for Sherman Associates, I was a pastor in downtown Minneapolis, also a business association leader, and used the bus every day. In fact, I would travel with Chair Hornstein from South Minneapolis and get to know not only uh, him and other Minneapolisans, I had the privilege of understanding the ins and outs of transit and how it benefited everyone across income types. At that time, I worked as a business association leader and was able to understand the downtown workforce as well as people who live downtown. First Covenant Church, where I was a pastor, had a number of folks who faced homelessness and we had advocacy and how they got around on public transit and really begun to understand the primary nature and need of all the citizens, whether they were impoverished or whether they had resources to use public transit. My children use public transit to go to uh, Minneapolis uh, College and to Normandale College. And all along the way, I got to know the leadership of Metro Transit and was beginning to learn of the funding issues that we had and how we continually spent a lot of time and energy and anxiety as to how transit would be funded across the state and became an advocate to understand this piece and why I'm here today. So I'm here today to testify to the importance of it, not only in the Twin Cities, but across the state as I travel to Duluth and to Rochester, where transit helps all citizens. And I would advocate that we find a way to find permanent funding for our transit system so that all, Minneap all Minnesotans, including Minneapolitans, St. Paulites, Rochesterites, Duluthians, where I go, and we provide housing, are able to get around and be able to get to schools and grocery stores and doctor's appointments that are so vital to their existence. Thank you for having me. Sorry for being here right at the nub. Yeah, well. And call me anytime to speak about transit. I love it. Yeah. Thank you so much. We had some very good conversations on the number six. We did. Line, so. uh, thank you for coming and, and your work in the community. Uh, next, we have uh, Dr. Yingling Fan from the University of Minnesota. And uh, some of us will be at the U tomorrow in a special uh, transportation seminar. So we appreciate all of your work over the years on this issue. Welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Um, Good morning, Chair Hoinston and the committee members. My name is Yingling Fan. I'm a researcher and a professor at Humphrey School of Public Affairs at the University of Minnesota. Um, my research in the past 20 years has focused on the issue of transportation equity. Uh, that includes uncovering existing uh, uh, inequities uh, and injustice in our transportation systems as well as putting people's lived experience at the center of transportation planning uh, to foster healthy and just communities. So my research focused a lot on health equity. Um, our transportation system has not been equitable or healthy because we have effectively prioritized building highways and use of private cars. Our dependence on fossil fuel powered cars and trucks has have shattered our communities, poisoned our air, and made private vehicle ownership necessary for full participation in society. Our transportation system has not been equitable or healthy because we have underinvested in public transit and overinvested in moving people in private vehicles. As a society, we have not provided uh, bus and train riders the same level of service that we provide to private car owners. Uh, multiple transfers and slow bus services mean few job opportunities for parents without cars and a few childcare, education, and family activities for their children. Our transportation system has not been equitable or healthy because we have not put the people's lived experience, especially the lived experience of underserved communities, at the center of transportation funding. My research investigating people's lived experience has shown that transportation is more than a mean to get from point A to point B. It's essential to all aspects of people's lives, including work, family, health, community, and uh, spirituality. 
So to the halves, the good transportation means well paved roads and uh, quick snow removal in the winter. Uh, but to the have nots, good transportation means a dignified life, a place to call home, a living wage job, and uh, essential connections to families and friends. So uh, please allow me to read a very powerful quote uh, from one of our research study participants, which epitomizes what transportation means to the have nots. Here is the quote. When you don't have ways to get around, it puts a stamp on your whole life. I believe that transportation is just the beginning of a pyramid. Everything else is kind of a domino effect. If you don't have access to good transit, then you can't keep a job. If you can't keep a job, you can't keep your home. Now you are homeless. You are struggling with homelessness. It's all a domino effect. Poor transit service has affected me because I cannot see my son as often. And I cannot go to the store to get things that I need because I can't get around when I need to. Um, so dear committee members, when you make transportation decisions, I ask you to reflect on their importance to people's lives and invest in sustainable long-term funding for better public transit for everyone. Uh, by investing in public transportation, we can uh, we can unite and connect people beyond their uh, differences. So thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Fan. And your uh, quote reminded me, we had a um, field hearing a number of years ago in St. Cloud. And I'll never forget uh, one of the testifiers said simply, what good is a job if you can't get there? So it reminded me of that, uh, that moment. Uh, our next testifier is Will Schroer. Thank Welcome you, Chair. to the committee. Uh, please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Chair Hornstein, members of the committee. Uh, thank you for having uh, me and, and all of us here today. And I want to thank MJ for uh, her support and not just the tech support. Uh, uh, my name is Will Schroer. I'm the executive director of East Metro Strong. As the name suggests, we're in a uh, uh, partnership between cities, counties, uh, employers on the east side of the metro, but we are uh, uh, supportive of good transportation for everybody in, in Minnesota. Uh, you're going to hear of a lot of perspectives today, and uh, what, what I'd like to add to the conversation is a financial perspective on equity, um, and uh, I hope that that is helpful to you. The approach that I'd like to take is a sort of, and not to make light of it, but ripped from the headlines approach, and uh, let's, just, let's just follow some of the news over the last couple of years and see what kind of insight it might suggest to us. Uh, last year, we read a lot of headlines about the, the uh, increasing cost of used cars, and uh, CNN pointed out that they have become literally unaffordable. I thought that CNN did a, did a nice job in particular because they didn't focus only on the price of the car, but the income that would or would not allow you to, to buy uh, and maintain that car. And uh, uh, just following on Professor um, Fan's comments, uh, the real world impact of, of, the, of the widening gap between uh, prices and incomes means that you have to spend more of your life, assuming that you can get to the job, working for your car, literally working for your car. Uh, since then, we've seen a number of headlines that suggest that used car prices are coming down, inflation is easing, et cetera, and I want to take just 30 seconds to, to put that uh, in context. Used car prices, sticker prices, have come down uh, from their, their tip-top peak. Um, they've started to go up a little bit again. No one really knows where they're going to go, but I want you to look in context, or let's all look together in context. Uh, yeah, they're down from, from 2020, uh, 2021. Uh, they are so, they're double what they were sort of back in the day. And I haven't met anybody uh, in or out of the, the more narrowly focused automotive world that thinks we're going to go back uh, to, to 2015 levels of car prices. Uh, not soon, probably not ever. Uh, we are in a new normal of uh, cars that are expensive to buy and expensive to maintain as they continue to get more complex. So uh, if, if you are a Minnesotan 
who uh, wants, who's uh, looking at their choices and, and trying to decide, do I need to buy a car? Uh, can I afford it? So AAA, uh, uh, a lot of different views on AAA, but uh, they're quite objective observers of the actual costs of car ownership, uh, observed a new record this year. Uh, costs of new car ownership have passed for the first time ever $10,000 a year, real money. Uh, so maybe you want, don't want to spend 10000 or you can't spend 10000 a year, so you're looking at used car prices. Uh, as I mentioned, those are falling, but at the same time, interest rates are going up, so the, the net is that the actual monthly payments uh, uh, have continued to increase. Those are not going down. Uh, and so monthly car payments uh, for a used car, uh, roughly 500 and, and change a month, that's better than $6,000 a year. That's before you put any gas in it. That's before you maintain it. That's before you insure it. Um, uh, $6,000 a year just to sort of uh, have a car in your driveway. Well, uh, if you don't have $6,000 a year, or if you uh, have better uses for that money, what are your other options? And uh, we, we tend to talk, I think, not always helpfully in Minnesota, but uh, but we do. We divide the state into the region and then greater Minnesota. So let's just do that for a second. Um, here in the region, uh, greater MSP, the region's economic development lead, uh, has identified, with the help of a lot of different stakeholders, a, a goal, uh, and recognizing that, uh, again, following on, on Dr. Fan's observation that, that you, you need to be able to get to a job, right, as sort of the start of your life, um, we need to have jobs that are near transit, and we need to have transit that, that are near jobs, and set a goal for how to measure that. Uh, that accessibility measure, as established by Greater MSP, has been falling steadily and is now worse than it was in, in 2016. So your, your, your options there are not good. Uh, let's say you live in greater Minnesota. Uh, Minnesota DOT, again, I think a, a objective uh, observer of the situation is tasked by you, the legislature, with uh, tracking public transit needs and, uh, and provision in greater Minnesota. They've established a substantial unmet need for public transit uh, in greater Minnesota and quantified the, what, it would, what it would cost to meet that need. Uh, right now, over the next uh, five years, it's $350 million. That's the size of the need, the unmet gap for people living in greater Minnesota who, who need public transportation and don't have it today. So to recap, uh, if you don't have the $6,000 a year, uh, wherever you live in Minnesota, you are facing a reduced or maybe non-existent set of transportation options. Uh, uh, I'm going to keep referring back to Dr. Fan's testimony because it's so good. A uh, slight version of that, I'm, I'm uh, privileged to be part of uh, Go Washington. This is um, uh, uh, an initiative of Washington County, the government of Washington County. And, uh, you know, in Washington County is sort of an interesting example of um, uh, urban, suburban, and, uh, and rural uh, resident, residential situations. Their residents, as, as uh, covered by uh, the county, have expressed to them the impacts of their inability to reach their doctor, their family, uh, their, their grocery store, because of the lack of, of transit. Um, and I uh, encourage you to think about uh, these observations by real people. So uh, I want to conclude with, a, uh, again, a headline from Bloomberg that uh, uh, because of all these factors, uh, people are falling behind on their car payments. They're li literally losing their cars to repossession. And Bloomberg says that's forcing consumers to make tough choices. What are the choices in Bloomberg's view? Car or no car. Those are your choices. And for too many Minnesotans, those are their choices as well. Uh, uh, you're going to hear from a lot of other people about uh, better choices that we can offer to Minnesotans. And, and, uh, but I wanted to leave you with that stark choice that too many Minnesotans face today. Thank you very much. Thanks so much uh, for your testimony, Mr. Schroer. Um, I'll take a pause here just to see if uh, there are any questions or comments from committee members um, to any of the testifiers. Representative Petersburg. Yeah, th thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and, and maybe to Mr. Schroer, who was just here. Uh, this is a complicated issue that is is it nearly as simple as it was presented that we just need to have more transit uh, or, or $350 million? And the reason why I say that is because, uh, unfortunately, currently, the only funding sources we have is based upon 
making sure that people are driving cars. And you see the, the, the complexity of that is that we are trying to figure out how to fund uh, a increasing and growing subsidies in order to make public transit uh, more uh, cheaper and easier and accessible while putting bigger and bigger burden on those that drive cars the way that current funding stru structure is. And, and one of the things that we talk about is how expensive it is to drive cars and that that, that transportation form is very costly and yet no one has talked about the, how do we help people that are using transit pay a higher, higher percentage of the cost of running it um, without having to dip into the pockets of everybody around them in order to pay for that uh, process. And I, I'm not trying to be facetious. I'm not, not trying to, to point fingers. I'm just saying it's very complex when the current system is there and there has been such a resistant, resistance to taking any money for that subsidy on a general fund dollars that it has to be constitutionally dedicated. It has to come from uh, all these things from MinFest and, and others that are all reliant upon people having cars. And, and I've heard so much even today about, well, we're spending so much dollars on our road infrastructure, yet I don't know of a single bus that doesn't ride on one of them. And, and so we have to maintain them. And so I'm just kind of saying, it's time for us to not keep hitting car drivers and, and transit drivers against each other but help understand that each has their own needs and in the areas and the costs are different and and how we fund them is going to be different rather than just saying it's it's just as simple. I don't know if you have any comment on that or not. Thank you, Representative Petersburg. Mr. Schro. Uh, Mr. Chair and, and uh, Representative Petersburg, thank you. Uh, and I appreciate the question and I would agree with, I don't know, 90% of what you've said. It, it is complex. Uh, we have set up a, a funding system which is um, among other things, ironic in that it, the, the more people drive, the better the, <laughs> the transit funding does uh, out of MVEST funds. Um, uh, I, I hope you didn't hear me, anyway, pit uh, one mode against each other. My, my goal, admitting that I only had the, the six minutes that was allotted, was just to sort of underline fo for folks that one of the challenges that we face here in Minnesota, which is that um, uh, as you correctly observe, it's really expensive to, to drive and own a car, and that uh, we haven't provided folks with, with good other options. Uh, and um, that's really all. Uh, and just the magnitude of that challenge was, was my goal today. You're going to hear, uh, and I know that this committee is going gonna, is gonna to grapple with um, ways to improve that situation, uh, and I, I look forward to being part of those conversations. Um, uh, my hope uh, this morning was just to, to uh, to help us think about, I think that um, if, if, if you'd indulge me, uh, Mr. Hornstein, for just 20 more seconds, um, uh, I, w when people ask me, you know, what I do, and I and try and describe it, and it's, you know, a lot of the times I get, well, we have to drive cars. We have to. Um, and we, we, a lot of people just can't. Uh, and a lot of people can't afford it. And um, this committee can make car ownership in Minnesota less expensive in some ways. Uh, you're not going to probably bring the cost, annual cost of ownership down a lot. Uh, so how can we uh, provide options for people uh, in a way that, that this committee can, can you, you can't change the price of used cars substantially. You can't change the cost of gas substantially. A little bit around the edges, right? But not, probably not substantially. So what other options? Uh, whether it's for affordability reasons or for just access to people that, can, that can't drive, right? They're the folks that I quoted from Hugo. They're retired, they're too old to drive. Let's get them to the grocery store. Let's get them to see their families. Uh, uh, that's my goal. Thank you. We have time for Thank one you. more question, and we'll give that to Representative Murphy. Thank you, Sure. Um, my concern about just what you're talking about, you, talk, you kind of focus on uh, cars as the, the main inflationary factor here. But it's, it's in everything. Uh, everything they're buying today has just gone crazy. And we have to look at why that happened. Otherwise, we'll never outrun this problem you're talking about. So we have the LA docks. You know, they were closed down, basically. We have people that are struggling with the, with the shot. We have a lot of things going on that are outside factors. But we look at this one as kind of the, the main fix, is going and just going to, going to transit. These people are struggling for a lot of reasons. 
and cars is one of them, but we have to look at the, why the, what policies got us here. The reason this is all jacked up and the reason we don't have these cars available, there's a lot of things going on. So trying to fix it with uh, just transit doesn't seem like it's a, a real a fair way of going about it, but that's just a comment. Thanks. Briefly, Mr. Frower. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Representative. I would just refer you back to the, the slide of the used car prices over time. And um, this is a, uh, th we're not going to get, the docks are open again, uh, supply chains are flowing again. We're not going to get back to 1970. Uh, and I don't know that transit is the only answer. I hope that uh, giving other options is part of the answer as well. But um, it's, it's something that we in Minnesota can do. We can provide better options, whether those transit, walking, by making it possible for literally for people to walk to the store uh, safely is another option that I think falls under the purview of this committee. Thank you. Thank you for your answer. Thank you for your question. Uh, we'll move on now. Uh, we have a couple of uh, testifiers joining us by Zoom. Uh, first is Dr. Sharon Pierce from uh, an institution in the district I represent, uh, Minneapolis Community and Technical College, the president and CEO of the college. Uh, welcome to the committee. Uh, please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Good morning, Chair Hornstein and committee members. My name is Dr. Sharon Pierce and I am the president of Minneapolis College. Our college is one of the most diverse in the state of Minnesota. More than 70% of our students are members of minoritized communities, international, low income or first generation students. This diversity enriches our dynamic learning environment. <coughs> Many of our students face intersecting barriers that impede classroom success. Unfortunately, transportation is one of them. Students cite late and unreliable buses as one of the top five barriers they face in achieving a degree. Too many students must navigate a bus commute that's unreliable or unreasonably long. Our college does many things to minimize barriers. However, strong public transit is a key building block to student success that we cannot provide alone. Investment is needed. Investing in transit will serve the 40% of Minneapolis college students who depend on public transportation to get to campus and the 29% who reported missing classes due to car trouble. To be successful, students also need reliable transportation to access health care, quality child care, job opportunities, food and other commodities, and recreation. Transit has a direct impact on the quality of all of our lives. So on behalf of Minneapolis okay. College students, I ask you as state leaders during this session to provide the investment needed to maintain yeah. and expand the transit service that students that. rely on. As you know, this is not an issue unique to the Metro, but one that significantly impacts rural and suburban communities as well. So please consider free or reduced fares for students, as well as investment in the rapid transit line. To quote Move Minnesota, transit is essential to creating a more just, joyful, and sustainable world. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Pierce. Uh, our next testifier also is joining us on Zoom, uh, Joy Rendell's Hayden. But they still don't have a quorum, I don't think. Uh, is Joy uh, Rendell's Hayden it, Joy. Uh, available? You should be able to hear it. I don't know why you can't. Mm, still. All right. um, well, we may have some technical difficulties. We can return perhaps to, uh, to this testimony later. Um, is Peter, I saw Peter Wiginius earlier. Here he is. <clears throat> we have one more oh, person you know than we I, had before. Hold on. We may be, yeah. you can hold one second. We may be navigating this issue here. I saw for a second the, uh, we were 17 empty chairs. Yeah, I know. You can't have a meeting with 17 empty chairs. I know. <laughs> they used to have 17 in the committee, but it may be more okay. this uh, session. But it's at least that many. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, I think we'll just proceed with uh, your testimony and then hopefully we can navigate this, uh, this issue. Maybe we'll have uh, 
have the testifier after you, Peter. Okay, is, that, is this yours? Okay. That's mine, Mr. Um, Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, please, uh, welcome to the committee. Um, Mr. Maginius, please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is Peter Wiginius. I'm the Legislative Director at Sierra Club, and I'm also a member of the Sustainable Transportation Advisory Council con uh, convened by the Commissioner of Transportation. So how can we address the problems you've just heard about? How can we effectively expand equitable access across Minnesota's metro areas? Simple. We can scale up and, re and replicate the success we're already having in Minnesota with bus rapid transit. BRT works in many areas. I'm going to focus on the Twin Cities metro area in part because when it comes to VMT increases, uh, the metro area is the problem, frankly. Fortunately, the metro area is also the solution. If the legislature is willing to fund a BRT, we can build it quickly. We can fund it through a local sales tax only in the metro area. These books are resources that people have used nationwide because bus neglect is a nationwide problem, both in regions that don't invest in transit and in regions that do. Minnesota is not immune from this. There are some inaccurate stereotypes about buses and the people who ride them, which are used to perpetuate that neglect. I won't repeat them here except one. Buses, some claim, are slow or unreliable, as if that is an inherent quality but it's not. When buses are slow, it is because of policy decisions. Fortunately, Minnesota has every model needed to complete, build a complete transit network. There are three forms of BRT in the region already, two in operation and one under construction. I'll go through each of the three quickly, but first, the obligatory disclaimer that bus versus rail is not a helpful debate. Ask me later if you want, but let's dive in. Gold Line, currently under construction from the eastern suburbs to downtown St. Paul, is an example of guideway BRT. The key feature of Guideway BRT is its dedicated lane, which provides for speed and reliability. Think of Guideway BRT as like LRT, but on rubber tires, also cheaper. The second form of BRT is Highway BRT. And Orange Line started in 2021 from Burnsville's heart of the city to downtown Minneapolis. The key feature here that allows for speed and reliability is that most of the corridor is on HOT lanes on 35W. When we were building Orange Line, we like to say it's time to put transit in the fast lane, and we did. For time's sake, I'm not going to uh, go through the, these next slides, except to say one good quality of highway BRT is that we can finally serve communities of color that were deliberately cut up or bypassed by the initial freeway construction. The next uh, uh, and third form of BRT is arterial, which is used on city streets, not necessarily in its own lane. Some would say that means it's not te technically BRT, but whatever you call it, it is extremely valuable. It is a vital, vital upgrade on corridors with existing bus service, which was or is needlessly slow. There's a lot you can do to improve speed, reliability, and the rider experience. The number one thing riders want is frequency. Um, the, which affects uh, overall travel time the most. Not every trip is to a nine to five job, so service on evenings and weekends is key. The other features listed here, common to all forms of BRT, uh, improve speed even without a dedicated lane, although that is also a choice. We have added dedicated lanes many times for both rail and bus. Arterial BRT is a proven winner on increasing ridership. This includes regaining pandemic ridership faster than other modes. These projects succeed because they provide riders what they have been asking for. We've mentioned most of these, but it is worth highlighting sidewalks so people can get to uh, more destinations, uh, so people can get to stations. Many streets approaching su uh, suburban transit stations don't have sidewalks. That is one of the reasons the transit funding packages that you have approved in the past include a 10% set aside for walking and biking. Thank you. When you put all these features together, you have expanded freedom for many people whose mobility, whose freedom is needlessly <clears throat> limited. People's freedom of movement is something we can measure from any destination. Uh, you can see a map of freedom from downtown Portland showing all the places you can get to just through transit and walking in 15, 30, and 45 minute increments. 
Different forms of BRT serve different markets. Arterial BRT is planned in core cities and inner ring suburbs. The other types can go much farther out from the core if we build them. It's worth noting that both arterial BRT shown here and highway BRT not shown were studied a decade ago and plans, network plans were developed for each. But only the arterial BRT network has been advanced quite slowly by Metro Transit. The other modes have mostly been advanced by counties, cities, and legislators. Again, thank you. Highway BRT is effectively an orphan. It needs adoption. The 2014 Highway BRT plan is sitting on a shelf. To conclude, bus neglect is something we can fix, but it didn't come from nowhere. It comes from biases in transportation uh, policy. The most obvious bias is funding. We expend epic sums, sums of money on car travel, sometimes spending millions on single intersections that are considered broken because drivers have to wait 45 seconds. But we have no problem making transit riders wait 45 minutes or more. The justification for this disinvestment is that user fees, in this case, bus fares that support transit, do not cover all expenses. This is true. It is also true that taxes and user fees dedicated to roads don't come even close to covering their expenses. It is true that MVEST benefits both roads and transit, as noted earlier. It is also true that roads benefit from many general fund expenditures from the state, as well as local sales and especially property taxes. That's not to say we shouldn't continue to maintain our roads. Of course we should. But since all transportation, both roads and transit, are subsidized, we need to move past the myth that roads pay for themselves. We can design our transportation system around other criteria like cost effectiveness, efficiency, equity, and environmental and public health impacts. In the interest of time, I will skip the rest of these except one. We will not get equity in the fourth, governance by equality of jurisdiction versus equality of people. We will not get equity in public policy if people are not represented equally in the decision-making process over transit dollars. For example, when votes are allocated on decision-making boards by jurisdiction regardless of population, rather than by population itself, then people are no longer equal. Should Carver County be part of our transportation plans? Of course. Including transit? Of course. But ask residents of Ramsey County if they should be less than one-fifth of a person in the decision-making process compared to residents of Carver County. I think they'll tell you no. Likewise, residents of Hennepin County should not be one-twelfth of a person in the decision-making process. There's a simple solution. One person, one vote is a principle you can use to fix this in any proposals moving forward. It is also the principle that brought all of you here today, having equal votes representing equal populations, to hear our testimony. And for that opportunity, I thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, members, we're going to uh, see if we can get uh, the previous testifier uh, online. And if not, we'll have time for perhaps one more one question for either of our previous two testifiers. So we'll try one more time here. and. Hopefully, is Joy uh, Rindles Hayden uh, available still? Try again. Okay. Uh, any questions for either uh, Peter Waginius or Dr. Sharon Pierce? Okay, we'll move on. Uh, thank you very much for your thank you, excellent Mr. testimony. Um, next, we have uh, Luther Winder from the Minnesota Valley Transit Authority. <clears throat> Welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Good morning. Um, good afternoon. Actually, good morning, Chair, committee members. My name is Luther Winder. I'm Chief Executive Officer for Minnesota Valley Transit Authority. I just want to start off by saying that as a transit provider, I've definitely heard and I agree with and understand the concerns raised by riders, some advocacy groups, and experts. Um, I and we support an equitable transit system that is sustainable, affordable, and comprehensive with coverage that reliably connects people in all communities, including community needs of people in the suburbs. This is an issue that is important to me both professionally and personally due to my life's work and being one of the few transit decision makers of color in the region. It's important to note that in 2016, when I came to Minnesota Valley, or when I was interviewing, 
I took a, I rode the services around the region and in this, in our, my service area that I eventually got the job when I was astonished by what I've seen as far as shelters as well as service quality. And I was really astonished and appalled by the fact that my system only had six shelters in the entire, I served seven cities and I only had six shelters, none of which had heat. And the bulk of my stops were flag stops. And the reason for that was lack of funding. Imagine being in a suburban, suburban community or being transitioned from the urban core to the suburban community and realizing that you go from having to go to a bus stop to hopefully understand you have to flag a bus down on a roadway that is unpaved, that doesn't have this, un, that, that has snow. It was, it, it still to my, to this day, even though we worked hard to transition over, still 40% of my stops are flag stops. And we've uh, we raised that to 25, over 25 shelters in the service area but the bulk of them don't have heat so because of the lack of funding. So it's important that transit is inclusive service, but it has to be welcoming to everyone, but it also must be available to everyone. The pandemic exposed a real and unanswered need due to the change demographics in suburban communities, a need for equality that I've spoken frequently about, but has been unable to meet prior due to lack of funding investment. Most of the affordable housing built in, is built in suburban communities. Since 1996, over 35, over 350,000 affordable housing units have been built over 180 communities. Less than 20% of have been built in the core and urban center. Disproportionately, about 25% have been built in my, in the 12 um, STA communities. In 2019, Microtransit and VTA Connect, following the lead of Southwest Prime, was started we started with two retired buses, two retired cutaways, no additional funding, and has now grown to 19 buses, six of which are past useful life. I talked to my chief operating officer yesterday and said five are in the shop right now because we still have those challenges. Um, with ridership increase of over 130%, the vast majority of people on our micro transit invitation connect are women, people earning less than $50,000 a year, approximately 20% earn less than $15,000 using a service primarily to go to work, as well as to connecting to our regional transit centers in my service area. Our reverse commute, our express service, like the demonstration project on Route 495, the last received general fund appropriation in 2017, those customers are disproportionately people of color using the services to go to work in Scott County and in Dakota County from the urban core. Move Minnesota highlighted that only a small fraction of jobs is reachable by transit in 60 minutes. Express and micro transit are some of the fastest modes in the region complemented by BRT. Express routes and micro transit are by shortening distances and providing first and last mile to people between jobs and people. Transit providers right now like Minnesota Valley are faced with the decision of how to meet the demand of, of micro transit and continue to boost our other modes of service as they continue to return. We can't do both. We never have. For MVTA, trans equity means coverage, but must, but, but must be just as much a priority as frequency. Justice 40 and disadvantaged communities within the suburbs need equity, but most importantly, inclusion and electrification, transit amenities like providing heat and windscreens improvements, and dedicated microtransit funding to meet the coverage needs of today and for the future. Thank you. Thank you so much. I uh, appreciate your testimony, and uh, we'll be revisiting... Uh, that microtransit uh, issue uh, later on in our committee deliberations. So thank you for that. Thanks, sir. Our next testimony is from Anthony Taylor. <clears throat> Welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Yeah, thank you. Good morning. My name is Anthony Taylor. And thank you, Chair Hornstein. And thank you, committee members. Um, Uh, my, hey, my name is Anthony Taylor. I am actually uh, here representing the Cultural Wellness Center, and really on behalf of me, all the organizations, uh, particularly around active living and tr uh, multimodal transit, move men, bike men, all of those that really support us in community. Um, and as an organization, we really work from East Side St. Paul all the way to Ely to actively uh, work to connect communities of color, really to the amazing outdoor uh, and uh, active living opportunities that are really a part of why we live in Minnesota. 
I think that I actually consider myself uh, typically, I think, a cyclist who really became an advocate around biking, who really learned that this was actually me being an advocate for active living and transit. And most uh, recent iteration of who I am is really um, a mobility justice advocate. And this has really emerged in terms of work that I've done regionally and nationally around how we're connecting uh, equity to what we do in terms of transportation. And I think that um, I really would like to express my evil plan is that we, um, all of us, work actively to move behind an idea of mo mobility justice um, and that we partner uh, to permanently fund transportation done well and really think about that as mobility and really understand that it is central to creating equitable economic vitality and quality of life impacts for all of our communities right now. Mobility justice as a frame demands that we are fully fully excavate, recognize, and reconcile the historical and current injustices experienced by communities um, with, that, with impacted communities, you know, given um, space and resources to envision and implement planning models and political advocacy on streets and mobility that actively work to address historical and current injustices experienced by communities. I acknowledge that transportation and mobility can be interpreted in a multitude of ways. But at its core, mobility is the ability to move or be moved freely and easily. Um, this is good transportation. And we believe that all people have a right to mobility. This includes disabled folks, you know, immigrant communities, uh, migrant workers that are in the, our communities, um, that we are really thinking about people experiencing homelessness, youth, elders, and other groups who have been historically uh, confined in their mobility for a variety of, of social and political reasons. A person's ability to move around freely is directly tied to their access to opportunities, such as jobs, education, affordable housing, affordable health care. I would say this is also the foundation of good transportation. If a person's transportation options cannot physically get them to their appointments, to attend school, um, to connect to the important assets in their communities, uh, then mo their mobility is constrained. If an individual has limited or no access to transportation and mobility options, they will also likely have less access to power and decision-making processes. Mobility and transportation done well are the lifelines of healthy communities of opportunity. As we make investments in, in innovation and the future that we think about transportation, I think we need to think more expansively about mobility. Do we, uh, do we stay in the status quo? Um, or do we take this opportunity to say, yes, we absolutely need, for example, EVs, and we need charging stations, right? Um, but we can also expand other transportation options, buses, uh, BRT, light rail, uh, commuter rail, streetcar, cycling, walking. As you make decisions and work deeply to increase options for funding transportation well, let's, let's say mobility in the form of transit, bicycling, walking uh, specifically, Please consider that transit-oriented development is intersectional in its nature because the impacts to access to opportunities is influenced by this. And those opportunities such as jobs, education, affordable housing, and affordable health care and active living provide the foundation of the communities of opportunity that we all aspire for and that are part of why we stay and live in Minnesota. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. Uh, our next testifier is uh, Michelle Molstead. <clears throat> uh, welcome to the committee and please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Michelle Molstead, uh, Chair Hornstein and committee members, uh, Michelle Molstead, St. Paul, Minnesota, a Move Minnesota volunteer. Thank you for taking your time to listen and to uh, make decisions about transit for all of Minnesota based on uh, good data and helpful stories. Uh, very early this morning, I learned from Google Maps that I can take transit from St. Paul to a point in every uh, committee member's district by transit, uh, except for uh, Representative Murphy's, according to Google Maps, but they were wrong. I learned about Rainbow Riders so I can make it to Brandon, I believe, <laughs> which is uh, an intriguing project, which I'm looking forward to doing. Uh, I confess, I did not take transit today, although I'm a regular transit user. I rode my bike, it's 
not far, uh, and the parking is really great. It's 21 steps to the front door, uh, and it's a little faster. Uh, I'm embarrassed about that a little bit. I told a friend that, and she said, don't be embarrassed because uh, bikes and transit are, work together really well usually, and they're all a really important part of our transportation toolkits, so um, I'm no longer embarrassed. As I was riding over, though, I was thinking about my testimony, uh, what to say, how smug I feel about no longer lo owning a car and the money I save, uh, uh, the little community of transit riders at my bus stop at 5.30 in the morning talking about uh, food and concerts and uh, how good or bad the Vikings were playing. Uh, but I keep returning to the testimony from Janice Watts of Fresh Energy at this very committee two years ago uh, in discussing Rosa Parks and Claudette Colvin and Transit Equity Day. Uh, Ms. Watts used the phrase, freedom to travel. Uh, I stopped at the Hubert Humphrey statue uh, on my way over and uh, read some of his words. Uh, particular favorite is his statement, Freedom is not real to me when I have it and my brother does not. Freedom to travel is a value uh, I'm confident everyone in this room shares. Uh, thank you, Chair Hornstein and committee members for centering transit policy around the freedom to travel for everyone in our state. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. And as a, a fellow non uh, car owner, I've also had those um, many minutes on Google trying to figure out <laughs> particularly how to get from point A to point B. So I can relate to that testimony a lot. Thank you. Um, our next testifier is uh, uh, Shanasha Whit Whitson. Welcome to the committee. Uh, please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Good morning, members of the House Transportation Committee. My name is Shanasha Whitson. I'm the Executive Director of Community Partnership Collaborative 2.0. We provide referrals to psychologists and psychiatrists for those experiencing mental health issues, case management to those impacted by gun violence, navigation to those seeking insurance through Minsure, and consulting to those starting small businesses. Transportation is so important to communities. However, the history of transportation in the black community is one that has always divided and or destroyed the economic viability of the community. There are dozens of examples that we are well aware of, most notably in St. Paul, where Highway 94 ran through the vibrant Rondo community. Since this is a Transit Equity Day themed hearing, equity to me means fairness and justice. With transportation, that means expanding public transit without repeating the same harms. In future planning, it means involving people who use transit, especially those who have been harmed or left out. When Community Partnership Collaborative 2.0 partner with Move Minnesota to provide education and awareness about the Blue Line, we were super excited. The community I serve was super excited. But we need to make sure that transportation like the Blue Line does not destroy economic possibilities for the community and instead creates an economic conduit so that the historically poverty stricken communities can access the transportation that they need to rebuild and build wealth. Transportation is very vital. It's a very vital part of the community's existence and it's one of social determinants of health, especially for those who have historically experienced health disparities. I hope that you members of the Transportation Committee will commit to deeper, long-term, and truly equitable funding for transit. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony and your work in the community. Um, our next testifier is Grace Bessicaley. Grace, uh... Okay, hopefully we'll uh, hear from Grace later or another time. Uh, our next testifier is uh, Sandy Lucas, uh, who will be joining us on Zoom. 
Sandy, are you uh, available? Sandy Lucas. Okay. Hopefully we can return to that testimony as well. Uh, our next testifier is uh, Miguel Moravec. After Miguel's testimony, we'll take a quick break to see if there's any questions of Miguel or any of the other testifiers. Uh, welcome to the committee. Uh, please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Good morning, my name is Miguel Moravic and I work for RMI. Transit equity is climate justice. And prioritizing these values takes comprehensive policy at the state level. Today, we'll discuss a compelling strategy from Colorado that we believe advances equity and has many co-benefits that could be potentially viable here in Minnesota. For those of you who aren't familiar with RMI, we're an energy nonprofit working to make a zero carbon future more accessible for all. all. Our tools were used by the state of Minnesota to develop the climate action framework. And we also co-lead the America is All In Coalition, the largest grouping ever of localities, businesses, and cultural orgs, um, including many here in Minnesota, looking to solve the challenges of climate. So let's be clear. Climate change is one of the lar largest drivers of inequity, both in the US and globally. Impacts like those you see on the right are escalating, and in addition to threatening our health, they're also driving up the cost of critical needs like food, water, and housing. These disadvantages are distributed unevenly among vulnerable populations, especially for communities of color. So if fighting climate change is central to advancing a just future for all, why is Minnesota not aligned with its own statutory targets? The answer to this is transportation. In the US and Minnesota, transportation is the largest driver of greenhouse gas emissions that cause climate change. Reducing rather than expanding pollution in transportation systems goes hand in hand with promoting justice for frontline and fenceline communities. While there's been many positive policy developments in this space, uh, more needs to be done. Analysis shows that spending from the bipartisan infrastructure law, taking those dollars and putting them towards emissions intensive, less equitable projects like highway emissions would actually increase emissions even higher than they are now. And while the Minnesota clean cars rule is a positive step in the right direction, electric vehicles alone will not solve the emissions in this sector. Expanding transit and multimodal solutions must be a part of this strategy. I'll say that again for emphasis. Expanding transit and multimodal solutions must be a part of the strategy if we're serious about tackling climate change and inequity. As has been mentioned today, though, these projects are underfunded and will not meet projected mobility um, requirements for Minnesota. To solve the lack of investment in multimodal options, RMI looks to the Colorado Greenhouse Gas Planning Standard as the gold standard of equitable mobility policy. This rule works by not just measuring emissions, but taking action on the data and setting local level MPO climate targets. Then investments from the state DOT are obligated to meet these targets and shift dollars towards projects that expand access and affordability. In this case, Colorado shifted $1.5 billion away from highway expansion projects and into bus rapid transit and multimodal solutions that better serve residents. <coughs> this standard will not only align transportation projects with 100% of the state's climate goals, but it will also produce $40 billion of savings for everyday commuters across all modes. If Minnesota were to adopt a similar planning standard, 
it would best position itself to be competitive for $200 billion of discretionary funding from the infrastructure law. As has been discussed, the funding is out there if you prioritize equitable projects. Please note that this money is reserved for communities in Minnesota in both rural and urban areas where they need it the most. The need for affordable transportation is important now more than ever. Three out of four rural residents live well below the statewide median income. And more and more people are facing obstacles to exercise their freedom to move. This Transit Equity Day, I personally celebrate Rosa Parks and her decision not to just observe and measure and discuss the inequities around her, but to also stand up and act on them, advancing transit access for all. This body has the opportunity to also act and not just measure on inequity. In conclusion, consider adopting a transportation planning standard like Colorado's, a policy that digs deep into making transit more accessible through investment and that allows Minnesota to lead the Midwest in meeting climate goals and providing more affordable mobility for all. Thank you for considering our presentation and I stand for questions. <coughs> Thank you so much. Um, members, we'll, uh, we'll take a break for questions in a second, I, or shortly. Um, I think we do have Sandy Lucas potentially back with us, so we'll hear that testimony, and then we'll take a quick break for any questions. Th and thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Hi. Well, can you hear me? Uh, glad we connected with you. Uh, please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Hi, Sandy. my name is Sandy Lucas. I am a teacher uh, librarian at Leap High School in St. Paul. Um, we're, we're the only public high school in St. Paul specifically for new to the country immigrants and refugees. Um, Sorry, I missed my, my call earlier. I'm actually at the library here at school, so I had students in here. Um, the school district eliminated access to school buses for our students during the first semester this year, and our students relied on public transportation to get to school. And while we were very grateful to have the public transit alternative, um, our students reported witnessing everything from um, open drug use to sexual and physical assault um, during their rides on the trains and buses, which for our students who have already experienced a lot of trauma, re-traumatize them on pretty much a daily basis. Um, support and investment in public transportation is one of the best ways to redistribute wealth in a community. It is a matter of equity, um, which many of you have already uh, addressed. Thank you. Um, many who cannot afford to drive their own vehicles, including most of our students, must rely on public transportation. I believe that if public transportation were more reliable in terms of time, and if it were more accessible in terms of where, where it is available, and if it were safer, more people, regardless of the economic status, would use it, decreasing the ecological effects of individual vehicle use as well as providing a natural space for people from different walks of life to mingle. Thank you for your attention to this very important issue. Thank you so much. We're, I'm so glad that we were able to connect with you. That was really very helpful and important testimony. Uh, and now we are gonna take a break for questions uh, for any of the previous testifiers since our last question break. Uh, and we have Representative Olson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, and this is really in, in response to some excellent comments that were just made from the last testifier. Uh, so I think that Chair Hornstein will probably acknowledge that I'm one of the individuals on this side of the table who doesn't automatically discount the idea of metro transit or trains or any of these things. I've never brought forward an amendment to try and kill some, uh, some train that has been just a, I think one member last year used the word boondoggle many, many times on the floor. Uh, but I've never done that. So I, I fully understand and believe that there is a part that needs to be played with metropolitan transportation. Uh, with that being said, uh, I'm a logistics officer in the Army Reserves. My job in the Army is to get all the supplies that the soldiers need to the battlefield. First off, as efficiently as possible, but secondly, just to get it there. 
Right now, what it seems to me is our transportation system here in the metro is just getting it there. There's no efficiency whatsoever. We're not trying to make this a better thing. We're just trying to get more people or more bus stops or we're trying to put more money into it. We're trying to expand it to a larger area and very little is being talked about how do we make it better. And so I very much appreciate the conversation that was just had because one of those things, there cannot be an argument. We're talking about Transit Equity Day. There cannot be a conversation about equity without the understanding of safety as a primary driving force. That is, anyone who, anyone who can choose not to ride these is choosing not to ride these. Um, talking about open drug use. So the only time I ever ride Metro Transit is when I have to fly under Army orders because the Army has said, we want you to park at Fort Snelling. They've got a very large long-term parking at Fort Snelling. And then I jump on the bus, I jump on the train for one stop to get to the airport. That's what I do. And in my one stop, I have seen many things that make it so I will not, I will choose not to ride that. Even, even when I have something that I could just walk right out the door here, jump on the green line and take it for a 15 minute drive, you know, 15 minute ride to Minneapolis, I'll choose not to do that because I don't want, I mean, the last time I was on the train, uh, there was a dude who, man, he had some real nice jams going on with his, uh, his big old boom box and he was dancing up in the end, he was dancing all over everyone. And it's an uncomfortable situation that someone who's just trying to get to the airport to fly somewhere doesn't, I don't want to do that. And that's the biggest problem here. So if we're talking about equity day in transit, safety has to be a primary focus because without that, people who should be riding these, could be riding these, and would choose to ride these are not riding them, including myself. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your comments. And I, I know that uh, many of the transit advocates uh, in the room uh, are concerned as well. And, and we they are working with... Uh, Vice Chair Tabke and others uh, on legislation that we've passed through this committee uh, for transit safety a couple of times, and uh, we'll do that again this year. So we'll appreciate, you know, a, a, a deeper conversation and hearing about that topic. We'll hear from Representative Petersburg, and then we'll move on with our final testimony. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and to the current testifier that's up there from Rocky Mountain. Um, you know, first of all, I'd like to know kind of what your definition of equity, and you can certainly do that later, because everybody seems to have a different uh, definition of that. But my real question is in regards to your slide that talks about $40 billion savings between now and 2050. Uh, that would be 27 years. I'm assuming that you mean that's $40 billion savings to the, uh, to the uh, a person that's using transportation system. Do you know what the investment cost and what it would cost in order to achieve that $40 billion savings to those that are riding? Thank you for that question, Representative Petersburg. And I want to point out half of those projected savings are from safety, sharing in what Representative Olson discussed, um, from traffic fatalities, injuries, insurance, and vehicle property damage. So, so safety is definitely um, central to that. You asked what the cost would be of implementing that sort of standard, and uh, from my understanding of the Colorado rule, I won't speak to Minnesota, it takes pre-existing appropriated money and just shifts the investments from some types of projects to others. So um, I don't have an exact number for what that, you know, what that would cost here in Minnesota, but I do know if you're concerned about safety, if you're concerned about tapping into federal funding like that $200 billion of discretionary from DOT, this policy is what we see as the gold standard to getting more federal funds and support to implement the transit solution, or transportation solutions, excuse me, that you'd like to see here in Minnesota. Does that start to answer your question, Representative? Representative Petersburg. Thank you. Yeah, I think it indicates that we really don't know what the cost is. And, and even if we did, it sounds like you said in Colorado, they shifted it from someplace else, uh, which means that something else is, is missing those funding. and so. It, it's always kind of nice to know, you know, certainly what we think the benefit is, but if we don't know what the cost is, we don't know really if that benefit is worthwhile. And it's, it's, it's a hard thing to get our handle around um, for us to um, put our heads around. And so, Mr. Chair, I'm sure we'll be talking about this later as well. Yeah. So thank you. And, thank and you. very quick follow-up. Yes, please. These savings were calculated using federal formulas um, for the state of Colorado that would very much be applicable here in Minnesota 
and RMI stands ready to conduct that analysis to help inform your process as you consider prioritizing certain investments over others. Thank you. Um, and before we move on to the next uh, set of testifiers, I just wanted one, one more opportunity to uh, address the important question that, uh, or point that Representative Olson made. You know, in addition to Representative Tabke, Representative Elkins, uh, Representative Sensumura are also engaged in this safety conversation. And uh, Representative Tabke, you had a, wanted to make an announcement about a, a meeting coming up on that. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, so, yes, as uh, someone who has become an unexpected, uh, unexpectedly transit-dependent uh, person getting between Shakopee and uh, the state capitol most every day, um, I've experienced a lot of what uh, Representative Olson and a lot of folks have talked uh, here about. And so we have been working on this for a while, but we are working on uh, a project to um, not just the transit, uh, what we lovingly called the Transit Ambassador Project uh, for years now, um, but other ways we can improve safety in, uh, in the transit system, specifically on Green Line and Blue Line. And so I've talked to a lot of the folks in the room here so far about this uh, plan and what we want to do. But um, on a week from tomorrow, so February 10th, on Friday at 11 AM, we're going to be having uh, just a community discussion via Zoom. So anybody who is interested in transit safety and has ideas and thoughts, we're going to introduce a concept that we're uh, working on and get feedback on that. And then uh, toward the end of February, have a committee hearing uh, all about transit safety. So uh, that is that is our plan moving forward. So if you uh, want to get Zoom link and be invited to that, uh, just text uh, Enid. Is that OK? Or send an email to Enid or myself, and we'll make sure that you get on that list. So just wanted to make sure everybody was aware. Thank you for that uh, initiative. Uh, okay, members, we're um, kind of going to uh, have our, our last set of testifiers and uh, excited to have Ryan Timlin, uh, who can speak from the perspective of a, a transit operator. Does it matter which spot here? Uh, wherever you okay. feel comfortable. All right. Thank you. Welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and uh, proceed with your testimony. Thank you. Uh, my name is Ryan Timlin. I'm president of Amalgamated Transit Union Local 1005. Uh, we represent 2,000 transit workers in the state of Minnesota, mainly on Metro Transit, but also in Rochester and uh, um, the first transit property that operates the U of M buses and Plymouth Link buses. Uh, thank you, Chair Hornstein, and thank you, Committee, for having this today. Uh, I do like to say, you know, it is an honor to be speaking about equity, uh, especially December uh, 1st, 1955, with the actions that Rosa Park took uh, to begin the end of segregation on the bus systems in Alabama and create more equity throughout the country. Uh, the Civil Rights Movement, you know, one of its huge goals was not only um, uh, ending segregation, but economic justice. And um, I'd just like to say, you know, as a union member, one of the biggest things that ATU does is make sure that everybody is equitably represented. So no matter what job you're doing, you will get paid the same thing, no matter your race, creed, background, religious background, or any of that. Um, you're paid for your work classification, whether you're maintaining or operating or or if you work in the call centers that um, answer the, the um, to assist riders in getting to the correct buses. Um, we, you know, we provide services to extremely diverse communities. And if you walk into Metro Transit, you will see it's an extremely diverse community that works there. Um, with that being said, one of the big, as I mentioned before, uh, economic justice. Uh, one of the things I'd like to raise here today is too often in the transportation only the focus is on brick and mortar and not the actual workforce who maintain, operate, and provide these services, who actually come from these communities and actually use these services as well, too. Um, many workers in this country are facing you know, economic strains, as has been referred to, with inflation. I mean, look at what egg costs are going up consistently every day. With that being said, we're, we're struggling to find the workforce while this system is being expanded. And one of the things ATU is trying to fight for, and I think every worker 
should be demanding across the country for equity uh, is cost of living adjustment being brought back into our, co our contract where wages go up with inflation, but even demanding a bit more than that, cost of living plus 1%. I don't think that should just be within our workforce. I think that should be a demand for all workers across the country. But I want to bring it forward here to talk about we have a shortage and we need answers to uh, on safety. And if anybody wants to talk about safety, we have the workforce that will talk to you about safety. We've been trying to get these words out for a long time about safety on the system. But also, we need the workforce there and one of the issues is actually wages to help keep up with the ever uh, mounting cost that workers face every day and so um, that is one of the demands I just wanted to bring here bring forward here that we were really fighting for uh, for equitable to help workers equitably keep up with the uh, surmounting bills uh, rent food costs that they face consistently every day um, thank you for allowing us to testify. Um, and again, I'd like to talk to anybody here who would like to talk about safety as thank well. Thank you so much. And yes, absolutely. And we hope that you and, and other operators will participate in the meeting that Rep Representative Tap Vice Chair Tapke talked about. So with that, thank, thank you. you. And uh, our next testifier, I'm very, very honored to have in our committee, uh, Commissioner Irene Fernando from Hennepin County. Uh, and as Commissioner Fernando is making her way up, I, I wanted to let the committee know that um, since uh, Commissioner Fernando walked into her position at the Hennepin County Board, she's just been such a tireless advocate for mobility justice, and it's very much appreciated. So welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Mr. Chair Hornstein, representatives, thanks for the opportunity to speak, and thanks to advocates and residents for including me today. I'm Commissioner Irene Fernando. I use she her pronouns and represent District 2, which includes Plymouth, Medicine Lake, Golden Valley, St. Anthony Village, and Minneapolis. I'm the first Filipino American elected in Minnesota. I'm the youngest woman to serve on the Hennepin County Board. And I'm the first person of color to serve as board chair since Hennepin's founding in 1852. I am dedicated to advancing equity by advocating for those who are marginalized or structurally disenfranchised. And these identities and dedication greatly inform my testimony today. It is good government to follow data and eliminate disparities to benefit our communities. This requires a systemic approach, embedding equity directly into decision making and removing inequities in policies that are barriers to equal opportunity. Historically, our transit system heavily prioritized suburban commuters coming in and out of downtown and riders who are able to choose transit. Given the shifts in work locations and patterns, as well as a growing chasm in household income levels, Equitable transit design requires deeper commitment to workers and families. So night shift healthcare workers can travel safely, elderly can ride confidently, and a parent with grocery bags and a toddler can efficiently get home. Transit investments advance equity through economic and housing development, which we are already demonstrating with the Blue Line Extension Light Rail. The Blue Line serves communities who are transit reliant, racially diverse, and have felt the lasting impacts of historic redlining and disinvestment. Alongside transit investments, Hennepin is generating deeply affordable housing for residents, igniting economic development for small businesses, and building wealth for working families. Meaningful transit investment from the state can change the trajectory of what's possible for all Minnesotans, with transformational benefits from climate action to construction jobs to improved health and educational outcomes. Mr. Chair and members, thanks for your leadership and remaining steadfast in your commitment to transit equity. I appreciate the kind words about my tirelessness, but I'm also a little bit tired. And thanks again for the opportunity to speak. Thank you so much. And uh, I appreciate your comments and uh, I think a couple of previous comments about the housing transit nexus. And that's going to be something that we address in this committee as well. So thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, members, we have about a little more than 10 minutes and, and about five more testifiers. So I'm going to ask the remaining testifiers to stay within that uh, two-minute uh, uh, guideline that we gave. Um, and we have another wonderful elected official, um, Commissioner Becky Alper from the Minneapolis Park Board.
Welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record Thank and you. proceed with your testimony. Good morning, Chair Hornstein and members of the Transportation Committee. My name is Becky Alper, and I represent uh, District 3 on the Minneapolis Park Board. Uh, very happy to be here with you today. Rosa Parks was an all-purpose rider, transit rider. She rode for work, to visit friends, to get groceries, and for events. But there's a societal narrative that might have called her a captive rider because she didn't own a car. This commonly held idea by decision makers and transit planners says that riders fall into one of two categories, choice or captive. Choice riders, so the idea says, could drive places if they want to. So we need to woo them with things like Wi-Fi and cushy seats. On the other hand, captive riders have no choice because they don't have a car and thus will ride transit no matter the quality of the ride. This is a false dichotomy. An evergreen report from the nonprofit organization Transit Center argues that all transit riders have choice and it's better to describe riders as occasional, commuters, or all-purpose. When all-purpose transit rider Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat on the bus, she had choice. Rosa Parks fought for civil rights on transit. If you transported Rosa Parks to today, I think she would be fighting for many of the things we today call equity, things that an all-purpose rider needs. We desperately need the following to create an equitable system, increased walkability, frequent service, and higher travel speeds. We need those pedestrian connections to make transit work for people. Once an hour service just doesn't cut it for people working in a service job or as a seamstress like Rosa Parks or really anyone. And once on board in the name of equity, transit riders deserve dedicated bus lanes and transit priority to get where they need to go faster. It is not enough to be pro-transit equity without lending your voice to elevating walkability, frequent service, and travel speeds. We can only achieve these goals by providing long-term, stable, new funding. I believe that Rosa Parks would agree. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony and, and grounding us in some of that important history. Um, I believe Grace Bassett-Kaley has joined us. Good, good to see you again. Um, welcome to the committee and please state your name uh, for the record and proceed with your testimony. Hello, my name is Grace Basik and I apologize for being late. Um, it is excruciatingly painful to have to be dependent on fossil fuel cars. When I open up the Maps app to search up the bus route to go from Brooklyn Park, and let me specify, on the border of Brooklyn Center to Columbia Heights, a 10-minute drive is translated into an hour and 10-minute long bus ride. It pains me to know that I'll have to reluctantly pick driving over to public tran transit, resulting in the ill-advised consumption of more and more gas to congest the airways of Minnesotans, particularly those in low-income minority dense areas, highlighting the intersectionality of the climate crisis through transit. I am a 21-year-old climate justice organizer in the Twin Cities. I've been in this grassroots movement since the age of 16 when my drive was fueled not with fossil fuels, but with ambition and optimism, cultivated by those who emphasize people over profits. I spent my youthful years in the blue collared suburb of Brooklyn Park where transit is deficient. With two working parents having to be on the clock for most of the day, I could not depend on them to transport me from place to place, which restricted me. I was not able to pursue many opp opportunities such as obtaining a job, attending community events, and meeting new folks until I had the access of a car at the age of 17. I now travel south to attend college in Northfield at Carleton College, where besides the infrequent and due to its price inaccessible Northfield lines, transit is absent. College students are scrambling to find transportation into the cities. I had the opportunity to travel to Scandinavia this past winter break to explore sustainability in that region. The second I stepped into the metro in Copenhagen, I was envious of that the Danes had a robust transit system, efficient to the point where it was quicker to hop on the metro than to drive, not to mention cheaper and the commute was peaceful. 
The fact of the matter is transportation is a critical aspect of our daily life and from work to errands and to connections, we have to transport and it's imperative that we use the surplus to fund sustainable transit. Thank you so much for your testimony. Um, so we are, have three more testifiers and um, uh, hopefully we will, again, our, our goal is to uh, adjourn by 10. Uh, Amity Foster, Sherry Munyan, and Naz Nurkadi. Our, uh, and Antoinette Kamara, I think, was added as well. So um, if everyone maybe can come up so we can save some time. Uh, and then again, keeping your testimony to two minutes or under would be helpful. Welcome to the uh, committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Representative Hornstein and Chair and committee members. My name is Amity Foster. I'm a member of Isaiah. I live in Northeast Minneapolis in 60A, and I've been transit reliant for more than 20 years. There's a lot of research into how public transit builds equity in our communities and how it can also be a system that addresses past inequities. I actually wanna to speak to you about the community of public transit. I am part of it because when you see the same people every day, you are part of a community. I've seen people at their best, their most mundane, and sometimes our worst. Public transit is also where I see the inequities in other systems play out in housing, jobs, healthcare, and public safety. So I thought about the stories that I wanted to share with you, like what, tra what illustrates transit equity, stories about missing friends that I can't get to on the bus, times I've been on the train and tried to figure out how to help someone who was clearly in distress, but I couldn't. I wanna tell you about a, a guy I see regularly on the 11. He's older, I know people who would see him and be scared. He's a big guy, he's usually unkempt. You know the stereotypes I'm talking about. Once I started riding the bus again after the COVID restrictions lifted, he saw me and told me he had been worried about me. He was glad to see me and glad to know that I was still around. There's a lot of conversations right now about transit being unsafe and these are real concerns. We should not dis dismiss them as discomfort. I wanted to highlight the community because when we address needs through the lens of community, we're also addressing them with an equity lens. An equitable transit system is one that is safe, affordable, and accessible by all who ride and operate. An equitable transit system is one that is fully funded with long-term, dedicated funding because we have decided to make transit equity a priority, not an afterthought. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll go to Antoinette and then Naz and, and with Cherry, but uh, again, uh, we'll I think now need to go a couple minutes after 10, and I'm going to really encourage people to keep testimony short. Thank you so much. Welcome to the committee, and we'll uh, proceed with your testimony. Thank you. I'll try to keep this short. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Antonette Kamara. I do the civic engagement and advocacy work at a nonprofit organization called Ayata Leads, um, and we primarily serve and advocate for African diaspora women. Um, for me, public transportation is very personal. Both my parents immigrated to the United States from Sierra Leone before I was born, and public transit was an intricate part of our story, and it has been for decades. Before moving to Minneapolis, I mostly grew up in Cottage Grove, Minnesota, and we still use public transportation very frequently, going from the suburbs to St. Paul to Minneapolis, and I would really like to stress what a lot of the previous testifiers have said about the importance of expanding transportation in suburbs. For a large part of my childhood, my mom was not able to get her driver's license, and whenever we needed to get literally anywhere um, outside of Cottage Grove, we would wake up at six or seven in the morning, get a ride with my dad on the way to work, and catch one of like two buses that come in and out of Cottage Grove. And when I was little, I saw that as a fun adventure or like a little trip. Um, but now that I'm older, transit has become very essential for me as a student, getting to work, school, groceries, anything I need to do. Um, and I know a lot of students are the same way. In order to literally survive in Minnesota, public transportation is necessary for a lot of people. And looking back without rose-colored glasses, I can't imagine how difficult it was for my parents, for my mom, and all the people that are like her who do not live in walkable cities or places like Minneapolis, where we have nice transit apps and more frequent bus roads and transit options. Um, 
it's just very important to me that we stress that people all over Minnesota deserve accessible, safe, and frequent transportation. And to me, equity is addressing that. People deserve the opportunity to go about their lives, take care of their families, commute with ease. And I don't believe we can be a state that says we support immigrants and marginalized communities without actually making public transportation a major priority. There needs to be expanded options outside of cars, especially in suburbs, and I can only imagine the opportunities, the interactions, and the advancements that can come if Minnesota truly becomes more modern and supportive of the people who really need it. Thank you so much for your testimony and your important work in the community. Thank you. Is Naza Narcati? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, great. And uh, Naza, welcome to the committee, and I think we're, if you can keep your comments to a couple of minutes, and then we'll conclude with Ms. Manion. Absolutely, thank you. May I start? Please, welcome to the committee. State your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Absolutely, my name is Abdel Nasser Nokadi. You can just call me Nas. I work with Move Minnesota and I have been a transit rider my whole life here. Uh, it is how my immigrant mother took me to my optometrist appointments. It's how I explored and played. Transit was the means of which I obtained my education. And in a manner of speaking, transit provided me the tools to advocate for itself. As an experiment this winter, to put my money where my mouth is, I have gone totally car free. I take the bus to work 10 miles away, or my parents 11 miles in the opposite direction, or to friends or for groceries. The point being is that I do this. And because of my experience, I can say without a shadow of a doubt that we could do better. I can endure the transit in this cold. I'm young and I'm tough enough. But they say at negative five degrees Fahrenheit, it takes less than 10 minutes for frostbite to pounce on exposed skin. And just late this past Sunday, my connection bus dropped me off at my next stop with 30 minutes to spare at negative 11 degrees Fahrenheit. Transit riders will often be put in life or death situations just like that. God forbid it's worse when there are delays. If you expect this transit system to work as it is, you are comfortable with transit riders risking their lives as they did last weekend and the weekend before that. So what choice is there for those who cannot afford the alternatives or those physically unable to drive? To suffer, endure, you have to choose to refuse that reality. And that's why I work now at Move Minnesota and why we fight for everyday Minnesotans guilty of trying to get from point A to point B. And thank you for listening to this testimony. I implore you to fight even harder for transit this year. And thank you to everybody for showing up and showing out. And thank you to the committee for having us. Uh, and I'm sure you'll see us at Move Minnesota a lot more these next couple of months as we work together to fight for transit. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate your testimony. Uh, and then we're going to have um, Ms. Munyan as our, our last uh, testifier. And I'd like to, then we'll have a couple of very brief closing comments from Representative Senator Mira, who worked so hard to uh, help organize this hearing. Uh, Welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Chair Hornstein, committee members, my name is Sherry Munyon and I represent the Minnesota Public Transit Association. While we would have loved to have had a transit director speak here in person today, that was not possible. Short staffing prevents transit directors from leaving their offices. One of them, in fact, is backfilling in their dispatching office today. Unfortunately, this is not an unusual occurrence. Due to the lack of funding for Greater Minnesota Transit, there is a lack of staffing both within the offices as well as drivers. Yes, we sometimes even have our transit directors backfilling as drivers too. By increasing investment in public transit across the state, we can address economic and geographic inequity and provide greater access to our citizens in communities large, small, urban, suburban, and rural. Yes, COVID resulted in decreased ridership across the state, but that does not mean the need for transit investment went down. Greater Minnesota systems are under staff and inequities in transit services were only exacerbated by the pandemic. Other riders should not experience reduced access to the basics for groceries, healthcare, and job access because of the decreased ridership right now. There is a lot of interest in purchasing electric vehicles to reduce pollution, yet there is a serious lack of capital being provided to do so, particularly now when the cost of buying a bus has increased by at least 30 percent. 
And I would just let you know that that 30% increase is being applied onto orders that had already been uh, in place and agreed to previously, which is a major disruption for operating uh, budgets. Communities have varying financial resources and the required 15 to 20% match from our greater Minnesota communities for vehicles and operations also create inequities. There are varying levels of resources per community and this is becoming a challenge. The 15 to 20% match is required for both the state and federal dollars. So only supplying the federal dollars won't assist Thank you very much, Ms. Money, and we are over time and need to move on. Um, are we going to have our last, uh, just final words from very, very brief. Sensing yeah, um, just really want to thank the folks, uh, especially MJ Carpio, who put helped to put together the program today. I think we heard from just an amazing um, diversity of voices. I did want to lift up one testifier who was struggling um, to get there on Zoom, Joy Rendles Hayden, who is a constituent of mine. Um, Joy Rendles Hayden is a bus rider um, who uh, suffered a traumatic brain injury uh, as she was getting off the bus with her walker, um, and she has come to the Capitol year after year um, advocating for um, more safety training for bus drivers um, and also really wants us to be thinking about you know ensuring that um, our um, sidewalks are getting plowed for um, folks that are getting off bus and need buses and need that kind of support and you know the irony is that joy was not able to be here today because to get from her home in Longfellow to the Capitol um, over public transport would take over an hour. Um, and like we heard, you know, in the, the conditions, um, the winter conditions that we're facing, that was just not possible for her. Um, so those are the barriers that, um, you know, prevent more people from coming into this room that are transit riders. Um, but I think everyone who joined us here today, I think the committee members who I do feel like really listen to the stories. Thank you. Thank you again for your work and help in organizing today. So members, um, uh, next week uh, we'll have a couple of bills, uh, including uh, a major active transportation initiative that Representative Elkins will be bringing on. We are not going to be hearing Representative Cagle's bill uh, on Tuesday. That's been struck from the agenda, but there will be a couple of uh, smaller policy bills uh, that we'll be posting later today. And then a week from today we'll have a deep dive into the governor's transportation budget. So, uh, and then on the 14th, it's going to be the Representative Olson, Representative Murphy, and Representative Brand show uh, as we really take a deep dive into the needs of small cities, counties, and uh, other communities. So thank you very much for staying a few minutes later. With that, our meeting is adjourned.